In today's lesson, we're going to be talking about the floor function. What the floor function does is the floor function returns the greatest integer less than or equal to x. And it's often denoted by this notation here. So again, I have some input value x, and it's going to be returning the largest integer that is less than that x value. So let's take a look at how that works. Let's say we want to take the floor of 3.5. If you go on your number line here and you go to 3.5, you'll notice that what the floor is returning is it's returning the integer that is less than 3.5, but the greatest one. So if we're taking a look here, the first integer that you encounter when you go on the left direction of your number line will be 3. So therefore, the floor of 3.5 is going to be a 3. And again, it's not going to return a 2 because right, there's other integers that are obviously less than 3.5, right? You could have gone to a 2. We also could have outputted a 1. But the floor is returning the largest, and that largest would be a 3 in this case. So now let's take a look. What if we ask for the floor of 3.999? Well, 3.999, let's say it's right about here. And again, you're not going to be outputting a 4. The floor of 3.999 is going to be the largest integer that's less than 3.999, in which case we're going to also output a 3. And even if we ask for the floor of 3.01, that will also be a 3. Let's take a look at some more examples of calculating the floor function. So let's go through a bunch of these examples here. Now again, this is going to be the floor of 1.2. And again, the number line is helpful, so draw yourself a number line. This is 1.2. The first integer I encounter as I move in the left direction of my number line is a 1, so the floor is going to be a 1. Uh, take a look at negative 1.2. Now, the first integer I encounter as I move in the left direction of my number line here will be a negative 2. And in which case here, the floor of negative 1.2 is negative 2. The floor of 1 is 1, right, because the greatest integer less than or equal to my input which in this case is a 1, will return a 1. Uh, likewise here, let's take a look here. This will be 0 0.99, and I want to return the largest integer that's less than. So again, as I move in the left direction here, you're going to encounter a 0 first. So the floor of 0.99 is 0. Let's take a look here. This is the floor of negative 0.99. And again, as I move in that left direction, the first integer I encounter is a negative 1. So the floor will be a negative 1. The square root of 2, to find out where that's located, we have to approximate that to a decimal place. So the square root of 2 is approximately equal to 1.41. So the floor of the square root of 2 is going to be the largest integer that's less than that, which in which case that's going to output a 1. All right, let's look at our final examples here. This will be the floor of pi. Well, again, as you know, pi is approximately 3.14, so the floor is going to be a 3 here. And lastly, this is a one point. Just a bunch of nines here, three, four, five of these nines, and that's going to output a one, because that'll be the first integer that we encounter to the left. Okay, now that we've taken a look at how the floor function operates for given inputs, let's take a look at graphing the floor function. So let's take a look at how we would graph the floor function. Let's go through some inputs here. What we're going to do is we're going to start at the origin and move our way this way and see how the floor function responds. So the floor of zero is zero. The floor of 0.1, so you know we're just taking a very small step to the right here, is going to output a 0. Floor of 0.5, again we're over here, and that's going to output a 0. And a floor of 0.9 will be a 0. Floor of 0.99 is a 0, and the floor of 1 is 1. So what does this look like visually? Well, we have a solid dot at the origin because the floor of 0 is 0. And we continue on here, all outputting a 0 until we hit a value of 1. And then we have an open circle, and then you have a jump in the graph, which will jump up here. Now let's continue on. Continuing on here, we can see the floor of 1.01 is 1, floor of 1.5 is 1, and floor of 1.99 is 1, until we hit 2, and then again it'll jump up to 2 here. So we're going to continue on in this way, where it's going to be a flat line again, until we hit that value of 2 open circle, then it jumps back up flat line, open circle till it jumps back up, flat line, open circle till it jumps back up, flat line, open circle, and it'll continue in that way. Now let's take a look at how it responds in the negative direction. 
Well, the floor of negative 0.1 is going to be negative 1. The floor of negative 0.5 is negative 1. The floor of negative 0.99 is negative 1. And the floor of negative 1 is negative 1. So this becomes, again, it's going to continue on in this way. And it, this idea will continue on for each one of these. You can have an open circle here, flat line, solid dot, drop back down, open circle, flat line, and another solid dot, open circle, go across, and another solid dot. So uh, what we have here, this is a graph of the floor of x. Let's label this. Um, now that we have a graph of our floor function, we want to take a look at what is the domain range and some other characteristics of the floor function. So what are some properties of the floor function? Let's first look at the domain. The domain of your function are the input values. So what can the function take in? You can see here that the domain would be all real numbers, right? There's no uh, real number that you can't return the greatest integer less than that. It's all defined, and you can see this on the number line. Any value you choose in your x-axis, there's corresponding output. Any value I choose, there's a corresponding output. And that's illustrated throughout uh, this graph here. So the domain of the floor function will be all real numbers. Now let's take a look at the range. The range is a little bit different. If you're looking at the range here, you'll notice your range values are only of integer values, right? This outputs only a 0, only a 1, only a 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and you're not outputting anything in between. All the output values are of integer value. So the range of the floor function is going to be all integers. So you can denote the integers any way you like. Uh, commonly, it's denoted like this. Or you can just say uh, the set of all integers. So now we have here the domain of the floor function is all real numbers. The range of the floor function is the set of integers. Let's take a look at some more properties. So for the next property here, we want to look at is the floor function even, odd, or neither? Now, quite quickly, you can see that the floor function is not even. If I take a look at my y-axis here, I, again, I'm not seeing a mirror image in the left-hand side of the graph. If you look at the right-hand side, you've got this sort of image here, and I'm not seeing that going the exact opposite direction, right? We'd have to see something like this uh, for that to be an even function. So right away, we know it's not even. Uh, you can even see this from an example. For example here, let's say you take the floor. Again, to remind you, a function is even if f at negative x equals f at x. Well. If I calculate the floor of, uh, let's say, negative 2.1, well, the floor of negative 2.1 is going to return what? It's going to return the greatest integer less than, in which case here we're going to be hitting a minus 3. Whereas if I take the floor of 2.1, that's going to be returning the greatest integer less than, which is going to be a 2. So right away we're seeing that f at negative 2.1 does not equal f at 2.1, and that's just one example of an element in the domain. So therefore, if you remember, a function is even if it has this characteristic for every element in the domain. I just chose one where it fails, so therefore it's not even, but we could see it from the graph as well that the function is in fact not even. The function is also not odd. If you take a look here, if you were to rotate this 180 degrees, it may look like you might create the exact same image, but you really don't. Uh, as I move this over here, you can see that you're not creating. If you do 180 degree rotation on these points here, it's not creating the exact same image onto itself. Uh, again, we can see that with an example as well. Uh, function is odd if f at negative x equals negative f at x. So again, using the example we had just done, let's say we take the floor of negative 2.1. We had just talked about how the floor of negative 2.1 is going to output a negative 3, right? If you take a look here, just to remind you, right, we're returning that uh, greatest integer less than, so it's going to return a minus 3. And then if you go ahead and calculate the floor of 2.1, as we discussed, that's going to return a 2. So therefore, the floor of negative x would have to equal negative the floor of x for this to be true for all um, elements in the domain of your function. While in this example here, the floor of negative 2.1 is equal to negative 3, which is not equal to negative the floor of 2.1, as that's equal to negative 2. So we can see here, these two are not equal. So therefore, the function is also not odd. 
So therefore, the floor function would be neither. Let's take a look at some more properties. So again, taking a look here at our graph of our floor function, we can see here we have many points of discontinuity. In fact, anywhere there's a break in the graph, we're seeing these all here. These are all points of discontinuity. Again, a function is continuous if it's continuous at every point on its domain. We have all these points of discontinuity, all these breaks in the graph, and these occur at every integer value. So therefore, the points of discontinuity of the floor function are every integer value. All right, that concludes today's lesson on the floor function.